Hey, hey, hey. Welcome to the Friday Hangout. This is the show where we talk about digital marketing news we find interesting uh, and the folks that we find fascinating. This week we have a great new guest. It's Tonya, Tonya Reese. And uh, I'm going to give her a second to introduce herself and tell us a little bit about her and everything because this is also my first time uh, getting to know her. Uh, she is the editor of The Real Time Report and the CEO and founder of Modern Media, and I'm sure there's more to share beyond that. But I uh, wanted to introduce our my co-hosts or cohorts or accomplices, depending on what's going on during the week. Janet, how are you doing? I am doing fabulous. I'm like I like that you're keeping it together after our our, our pre-show discussion that we we had. Uh, Let people know. Steve, how you doing? I'm doing damn good. Thanks for asking, Adam. Why does it sound like a like a Eddie Haskell sort of response? What's going on with Not that? Not really. I'm doing great. Thanks for all, <laughs> for all you Leave It to Beaver fans. You know, because um, so many of them now. Yeah, exactly. That dates us here. Uh, Tonya, she has no idea what she got herself into. <laughs> It only goes and, downhill from here. So, and the uh, and the uh, and the topic of today is the evolution of real time marketing. Uh, and so, Tonya, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and why we're talking today about real time marketing? Sure. Hi, everybody. Thanks, uh, Adam, Steve, Janet. Glad to be here. And um, yeah, so as um, as Adam said, I run a company called Modern Media, and we work primarily with publishing companies to help them create new revenue streams, develop their strategies for how to better connect with their customers and communities. Um, and so it was very clear early on that social media was going to have a very big impact on how media brands can operate um, in the real world and connect with their customers. So we launched, um, initially, uh, we launched TwitterCon, which was the first ever Twitter for Business conference back in 2009. Uh, and that has since evolved into a series of events in the real-time space. The most recent one was uh, last October. We did the Real-Time Marketing Lab. And we also published the Real-Time Report, which is a blog that covers business on the mobile, social, and real-time web. So that's, um, that's the background. And it's a space that I've been fascinated with for a while. My personal background is not just in media, but in marketing. And it absolutely is, is just blindingly clear to me that real-time technologies and platforms are going to dramatically change the way that we connect with customers over the long term. And every company out there already, if they're not already, are rethinking the way they connect with customers based on the opportunity to do so in real time, um, really better get going because this will change the way that you work as a marketer. Well, I wanted to remind folks who are who are watching currently live or uh, maybe listening after the fact, if you want to participate and ask a question, please go ahead and tweet us at Friday Hangout uh, or go to the FridayHangout.com right now and you'll find the video playing live and you'll be able to, which is maybe where you're actually at, and you'll be able to uh, ask questions as well. Janet, how do you... Uh, how do they get to ask some questions via our Google Plus, uh, you know, you page? Ask, you can ask questions directly on the YouTube stream or on the Google Plus page, or you can ask us questions with the hashtag Friday Hangout on Twitter, and I'm watching that right now. Awesome. So, so Tonya, um, I think we should start off with, with having a clear understanding of what is real-time marketing because there's really a big... I'm not going to say it's necessarily a misnomer, but misunderstanding based on how the term is being used for uh, for some successes that folks have had in general with marketing. So we often think of, of things like Oreo cookie during the Super Bowl creating, you know, uh, creative uh, that's on brand but is also very sort of responsive to something that happened within only a couple minutes of that period in time where people are on Twitter and having a conversation or on Facebook or other platforms. It's almost always primarily associated with Twitter, it seems, more than anything. But um, is that the, the gist of real-time marketing? What is it? Yeah, the, the Oreo cookie has sort of become the poster child example of real-time marketing. And unfortunately, I think that's led to a lot of misunderstandings in the market because it's a very, very narrow definition of what real-time marketing is and what the opportunity is for brands. And I think a lot of um, the trade publications in the PR and advertising industry are kind of doing their readers a disservice right now 
by always referring back to that scenario as real-time marketing as though that was the only definition. Um, I see real-time marketing actually as much broader than that. And one of the keys, I think, uh, was mentioned a minute ago, which is the that you're making a connection to something that is happening in the real world, right? So you are essentially bridging the gap between your online or digital activity and things that your customers are experiencing in the real world um, right now, at, at this moment in time. The other thing that's important to understand, though, about real-time marketing, a really important component, because everyone thinks, well, real-time, that means fast, right? It means it's got to happen right away or it's got to be speed. Well, timeliness is important because that's part of what lets you um, communicate in a more powerful way because you're doing it in the context of a real-world experience, and time is one factor of that. But timeliness does not mean it has to be instant. It doesn't mean that you have to have you know, a team of lawyers ready to approve a tweet at a moment's notice. So when does something turn from, what's the threshold you'd say that something turns from being real-time to being not real-time? To me, the number one criteria uh, and shift with real-time marketing is, um, is actually not about time. It's about the fact that everything that is done with real-time marketing starts with listening and starts with an understanding of what is happening and what the conversation is that is happening whether that conversation is a macro level conversation that's a big cultural event like the Super Bowl or like the Olympics, but it could also be a conversation that is happening among a community of your customers that is relevant only to your customers. And you become part of that conversation and it shows that you understand that market, you understand that community and positions you as being relevant. Or it could be at a micro level. It could be an individual customer um, expressing frustration with a product or service and you stepping in to help that customer. All of those are examples of real-time marketing because unlike traditional marketing where we have a message and we put that message out and the message really doesn't change very much um, depending on who hears it or, or how it's communicated, in the case of real-time marketing your message changes in response to a conversation that your customers are already having. So, but isn't, I mean, so in all fairness, I mean, aren't what we're really talking about is what we already had, which is engagement. Um, it's just a new kind of, isn't this just a, a new label for, you know, one, one of the things that we do really poorly as marketers, we get caught up in trends. And sometimes a service in terms of it allows us to, like, talk about an area that's been under, misunderstood for a long time. But isn't this really just about engagement? Because it seems like this is like, you know, we're talking about responding to things in the time. And I, and I think there's already a... Uh, a, a weird dichotomy we have about doing things which are way over planned, way too long in advance, and doing things that are too quick and don't really have any longer impact or tie back into our goals. So isn't this just, is this another trend, I guess I'm asking, another fad uh, I'm asking? Um, well, I'm not sure the distinction you're making with engagement, first of all. What do you mean by that? Well, you're talking about like, responding to what people are saying in the community. I mean, when, we, when social media started, you know, kind of gaining speed like, you know, five years ago or more, you know, being responsible to what was the conversation in the community was already, you were supposed to do that then. That's why we have community managers. Isn't this the same thing? Isn't just the marketing people jumping and going, oh, yeah, we can do that too? Um, no, you're absolutely right. And I would say that with the, a, a great part of, of a community manager's job is real-time marketing. Is part of what real, what it was what is required to be a real time marketer is that you're constantly having a conversation with your community and that community manager is also you know look I can I can use a lot of tools to automate my listening but at the end of the day there's nothing like the value you can get from an individual conversation this is why we have focus groups you know in addition to large data sets that we're looking at because sometimes you get more value out of an individual conversation. So to me, that community manager role is really that person is the, the, the spearhead of your real-time marketing activities as a, as a company because not only are they the ones at the front line engaging, they also can bring back that feedback from those individual conversations with customers that will then help you adjust and shift your messaging over time. So I don't want to just lob this at your feet, but so if we look at something like the Arby's uh, Pharrell thing where he was wearing the cowboy hat and someone made an Arby's riff from the Arby's channel, Right. Is would you say that that's an example of real time marketing? And if you do, what's the benefit there for for Arby's? 
you know, there there are many different types of benefits that you can get with real time marketing, right? Depending on what what you're doing. In that particular case, um, the benefit really is, um, I would say, twofold. And you guys may even be able to think of some other ones, right? One is that one is a branding benefit, right? Arby's positioned itself as a brand with a sense of humor, with personality. It became more human, more approachable, and and therefore a brand that I, if I'm already predisposed, you know, I'm going to be like, hey, you know, I'm happy to be an Arby's fan. Or maybe I've become more open to being an Arby's fan because they showed a more human side of themselves. Um, and then the other benefit, of course, of course, is the buzz, you know, and the earned media, the value of the earned media by a funny tweet like that being shared around and talked about, discussed in other media outlets. So in that, and that also, that that earned media benefit is the one that has now, in the current popular definition of real-time marketing, has become most associated, you know, with that classic Oreo cookie tweet. It's all about the retweets and the buzz that you get and the free impressions. Um, but there are other benefits of real-time marketing as well, you know, that have much more to do with uh, lead conversions or uh, engaging customers more deeply, upselling, um, all of the more traditional direct marketing benefits, all the way through to customer service-related benefits. Um, so so I, I want to be very clear that, you know, while it's very kind of sexy to talk about the buzz building that can come from you know, a, a, an Arby's tweet or an Oreo cookie tweet, that for most brands and most, um, especially for smaller companies who may think, well, but I'm not Oreo cookie, I don't have those resources. You know, I don't have the ability to have someone 24-7 monitoring every tweet and responding to every tweet. Um, but there are things that you can do as well, even at a smaller scale, to uh, position yourself to engage with customers in real time to respond be be seen by your customers as more responsive and the way to do that is to really just think about what are the conversations that you want to participate in right and again where does that start how do you figure that out it starts with listening where are so your let's customers? talk about that a little bit more then because if if a small company, you know, they say, oh, well, I'm not an Oreo cookie. No, but there are lots of small companies that have done this really well, too, like the pizza company that responded at the Oscars. You know, that was really great. But that's a one-off event. And really, in my mind, real-time marketing takes a lot more depth than these really cool, high-profile, isn't that awesome, one-time events. So how do we use social media listening, for example, to expand on that and have real value down the pike as opposed to that, you know, one moment in the spotlight. Right, right. Well, and I think that's where the understanding of um, what the conversations are that your customers are already having, that, and they may not be conversations about your product or even your product category, right? Maybe your customers are... Uh, you know, maybe you sell a certain type of car and by looking at the conversation that your followers perhaps are having about other topics, you see, oh wow, isn't that interesting? Uh, my customers tend to also enjoy hunting, outdoor activities, you know, because of the type of car I sell. And are there conversations then related to outdoor activities such as hunting that I can start to monitor and pay attention to and participate in? Right? It doesn't have to be waiting for the next Academy Awards to come around. Your customers are having conversations about things that matter to them every day. So pick and choose and find the ones that are most relevant to you and find a way that you can add value to those conversations. So Tonya, you, you guys did a, um, a, a study, right? Um, you had a, a great post that we'll link to uh, with our show notes. And uh, I'm trying to recall exactly how many folks it was uh, that you had reached out to because I'd like to actually um, for our listeners sake um, read off a little bit about what folks said that they believe that their benefits were. Could you remind us about how many folks were surveyed for this? Uh, I don't have that number in front of me but I want to say it was a little bit over a hundred. Okay. And we okay. partnered with a company called Evergage uh, to do the study. Okay and so um, when, when asked how do they, what do they perceive the main benefit of real-time marketing, 81% of folks said increased customer engagement. And, 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 and that's broad and, and varied. We talked about a number of ways 
a number of things that could be considered customer engagement. Everything from you know in, in S simply listening within communities to engaging with somebody with a tweet on on Twitter. Um, and, and so, would you agree that that's sort of varied in in perception of what increased customer engagement might be? Yes, absolutely. Uh, and you know, and there are many different ways that you can define that. One of the most interesting things to me about the study is that when we asked marketers what platforms they use for real time marketing. Um, you know, again, if you believe the trade press, real-time marketing is exclusively a social media activity. According to marketers, however, they look at everything they're doing as having the opportunity to, you know, engage with customers in real time. So to them, it includes email, it includes their website. You know, there are tools that allow you to um, personalize the experience a customer has when they come to your website based on other actions they're taking. Right, so by monitoring and seeing what I've expressed an interest in, I can customize the information and the message that I'm displaying to you. And that's really another way to define real-time marketing is it's the personalization of the story and the conversation, you know, to an individual customer. So that can be on social media very easy to do because I'm having a conversation with you. But are there other ways you can do that in your email messaging, on your website, and other platforms that we have as marketers as well? So a few more of the numbers real quick here. Um, so 81% that was the sort of the highest benefit is increased customer engagement. 73% improve customer experience. And I think what you just alluded to, un, you know, initially listening and having some understanding of, of the, that that customer's personal interest and potentially even personal information to help make that experience feel more fluid and relevant to them is a big thing. 59% increase conversion rates. Um, and so th there, there's sales related right there. Um, and then I'm not going to go through all of them, but then shortly behind that, 52% improve brand perception. We talked about that, and it's amazing for me to, meet, to, to, to actually f uh, see that that's kind of less folks thought that brand perception was a benefit versus increased conversion rates. It almost feels, um, you know, leaning to, to what Steve was saying earlier, that it might be more about brand perception, but folks believe that there's uh, an impact on, on conversion rates and sales that can happen. Um, and then 52% uh, is, is to increase retention uh, or reduce churn for what I would assume customers or, or members of either communities and that sort of thing. Um, Steve, you know, dive in. I know that you you had something you wanted to ask. Well, I was just gonna I was gonna say one a couple of things. One of the, I think the theme that's going through here is to be real clear is, and, and we're not talking about you know, you're not talking about uh, real time marketing in a vacuum. You're talking about real time marketing truly in support of existing. Uh, outbound or you know outbound type activities that you're doing. Is that, is that fair to say? Yes, absolutely. So let me ask you a question: Is is do you have any examples um, of B two B use of real time marketing? Um, you know, that's a good question. I am not coming up with one right off the bat. That's the B two B specific one. Um, well, I was going to say is that you know I, I think one of the things that consumer brands have versus uh, and this is true for a lot of marketing things is consumer brands tend to have a lot more people. When you have more people, it's easier to get a collection of those, some subgroup of those people engaged. So you have that kind of critical mass of activity, mm -hmm. and so I, I think that the pro. I mean, I think that all marketing, in my experience, has application to B two B. It just depends. It just may change in terms of its. Uh, Scope. It may be like at an event of some kind, like at a trade show, or some other kind of gathering where there's a time-specific type event for a B two B audience potentially. Right. Well, I think the important, the one of the important distinctions between B two B and consumer marketing, especially when it comes to real time and the social media and the digital space, is that you have to take a step back and think about the the motivations for the reasons why a customer is or a prospect might engage with you in real time are very different for a B2B customer versus a consumer. Okay? With a consumer, there are many triggers. It could be they're a fan, they want to show that they're affiliated with your brand, they want to you know, wear your brand like a label. Um, in the case of a B2B customer, it's going to be um, much more... I, I, I tell them I'm not here. Okay, I'm busy. Say I'm not here. <laughs> not here. <laughs> yes, can I pass you on to Steve? <laughs> 
in the case of a B2B customer, it's going to be much more about make me look smart, right? Help me with thought leadership. Help me solve my business problems. So what are ways that you can engage with that B2B audience in real time that allows you to kind of um, be sensitive to those triggers and interests on the part of the... So where are the conversations people are having, for instance, let's say you're selling um, you know, cloud computing software, right? Where are people having conversations to help them solve problems about that space and how can you participate in those conversations? So it's just fine-tuning your antenna. What are the, you know, where are your customers having the conversation and what are the things that you should be listening for? And yes, can you do it at a trade show relatively easily? Absolutely, but you can also do it on Twitter. You can do it, you know, in your marketing approaches and when you rethink your next email campaign or even the way you design your, your website. Are there triggers that you can put in that give a customer a choice that then allows you to better personalize the information that you're delivering back to them. When, when, when you talk about triggers, what do you can you talk about that for a second? Um, well, in the case of an email, uh, it might be what is the day of the week that I'm opening the email, or it might be uh, in the case of your website, uh, what are the three pages I looked at. And then when I go to um, you know, a landing page, you might feature a different product on that landing page based on the three pages I just looked at. Would marketing automation yeah. and dynamic content play into that then? Absolutely. Or on social media, it could be that I'm looking for certain, I'm listening for certain keywords or I'm following, I've created Twitter lists of certain influencers that I want to develop relationships over time. Uh, and a good, you know, how do you develop a relationship with me on Twitter? Well, if I say something smart, retweet me or make a comment or come back to me, right? So have you identified um, a subset of people who are influential in your community and are you working on building relationships with them and then giving them content that they can share? That's part of real-time marketing as well. It, it sounds like if we were to look at it from sort of a high level, it really is about being responsive, relevant, and and timely and timely has a threshold to it but if you really just think about those three things and you say am I being responsive it, 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 the, the listening aspect I think what you said early early on is actually a, a, a gem that people need to remember which is it all starts with listening you, you can't just jump in it, that's not real-time marketing that's you know that, that's something different of, uh, but but when you listen to what people say you respond and then of course that conversation is relevant to the matter at hand or to the event happening or to the problem that your particular customer is is having um, there is a different trigger or different in trigger in a different term than what you were talking about earlier but something different that happens to the perception of that reaction when with customers where they feel this this brand or this person who represents this brand has actually listened to yes. what I had to say, and they're responding to what I have to say, and doing it in a timely in a timely matter. Matter, uh, of course, uh, I think we've established that real time often gets thought of as, um, you know, a couple of years ago the big trending term was real time because we could sit with our browsers browser, browsers open and see the action happening in real time because the technology was empowering that, and yeah. and we forget that that although that's happening up to the second that real time doesn't have to be up to the second although it can be in some certain circumstances it needs to be perceived in whatever the scenario is as being responsive within a reasonable time frame based on the scenario the situation the customers needs and those sorts of things right absolutely so in other words it, it's timely if it's still relevant right if I was to start talking about the Super Bowl today everybody would be like what why is she talking about that um, and, and, and customers and, and sorry to cut you off, I would say the customers uh, have often said, for instance, with Twitter, that they believe that if they don't get a response on Twitter when they say something that they've got on their mind and they need some help and they reach out and use Twitter as a customer service channel, that if they don't hear something between 24 and 48 hours, that they feel they're not being listened to. So that threshold for Twitter is on average around that time if you look at everybody from an aggreg aggregate perspective, right? And that's for Twitter as a channel unto itself. Right, right. And if you think about it, 24 hours is a long time. You know, you don't need to stay up all yeah. night monitoring your feed if you have 24 hours to respond. Depending on the brand and the customer set, you may want to be more timely. 
uh, KLM, I think it is, is actually posting their Twitter response times. They do, on, and they post okay. when they're available too, which is an interesting way to look at it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what you know, uh, I think we've we've done a really good job of establishing uh, all the some of the boundaries around what real time marketing is and some of the channels and such. I mean, you mentioned. Uh, within communities and I would imagine things like forums and all those sorts of things we don't have to necessarily label things as real-time tools there's tools that have real-time capabilities based on how you leverage them um, how can people measure success for real-time marketing efforts is there uh, you know what are some ways that we can do so I mean we have such varying channels is it what do you think Tonya uh, you know it, it's gonna tie back to what your business goals are right so if your business goals and your rationale for investing in real time is all about earned media, which by the way we didn't get all the way down to the end of the benefit list, but that was actually the the least popular of the benefits in the study that we did of marketers. I think it was something like 23% said, you know, earned media. But let's say that you're investing in real time marketing because you want to get those retweets. Then of course you're going to measure the impressions that you're getting. But if you're if you're investing in real-time marketing because you're looking to um, improve your relationships with a core group of influencers, you're going to set up a different set of metrics. You know how you're going to measure how you're doing against that benchmark. Um, so measurement is a very tricky question because there is no one size fits all. It's what just I, like it's just like social media or digital marketing measurements in general. Everybody's looking for the silver bullet, but it, it, it's like you said, it's not a one size fits all. Um, it, it depends on your business goals. So if, if we were to say maybe go back to the the inception of something like this, I wouldn't imagine that somebody at their company would, would sit down at a table and say, I want to create a real-time marketing plan. They likely are going to dice it up and slice it up into something that is relevant for their particular scenario. Um, how does something like that usually come to fruition? Do, do they um, try to establish a uh, a beachhead of a couple folks that are there to be more to be responsive in you know depending on the channel that they're in and and that's what they're really trying to do is to say we need to create a a group of folks or a, a somebody who's going to be responsible for being a community manager or somebody who's active on Twitter in real time is that usually the how it manifests uh, in a lot of cases yeah sometimes it starts in customer service right and customer service ends up driving and uh, you know we can have a whole conversation about customer service being the new marketing um, so that could be one place that it starts um, and and very often though a, a good a good way to start with real-time marketing is to experiment with you know shorter time frame based campaigns not that over time you want to be you know always doing a campaign you want this to become part of your ongoing DNA uh, but but running a series of campaigns allows you to see to play with different approaches and see what's going to work for your brands and for your customers, and then you you can take those learnings and start to develop best practices uh, that are embedded and core to the team, not only the social media team but the broader marketing team over time, um, that allow you to just become more and more of a real time marketer, and. And again, let me go back to the basic, right? What do I mean by being a real-time marketer? Is that you've really made a fundamental shift in your mindset of how you think about the dynamic and the relationship between you and your customers and how you communicate with them and how you engage with them. So just before we dive into our next segment, because we, we've got some cool things, even real-time related, that we can share in just a moment, I, I want to ask you one last thing to sort of tie everything back together. Now, the, the title of today's show is The Evolution of Real-Time Marketing. Um, I, I'd like to know, you know, five to ten years from now, do you have any ideas of where you think that this, this portion of the industry is going? Because you, you talked a lot about mobile and, and other things initially, um, and it sounds like these may be drivers that the technology is going to help drive a lot of this. But w what are your thoughts on the future of real-time right. marketing? No question. Um, two things that I'm paying a lot of attention to right now. We talked earlier about the triggers, right? What are the different things that can trigger personalization of a message or engagement with a customer? I think that those triggers are going to continue to expand, right? The possibilities, the kind of information that our customers are going to share with us as marketers is already enormous, 
right? But as we see things like wearable technology become more common, uh, we already, you know, are pretty familiar with the possibilities around geolocation. And um, but how do we get better at using that as a trigger, or incentivizing, or making it easy, or giving customers a reason to share not only you know what they're doing, but where they are, and what time you know what time of day it is, and what their flavors are that they're interested in. Uh, so I think the different types of triggers are going to continue to expand. Uh, there are also triggers from sensors. You know, it doesn't all have to be a human person saying something or actively saying something. It might just be that there is a sensor in their car that's giving you information that you can then respond to and use as a reason to engage with your customer. Uh, so I'm paying a lot of attention to what are the new and evolving types of triggers that are going to be out there. The other big challenge that we have to solve as an industry is by its nature, because we're talking about personalization and engagement at an individual level in many cases, how do you scale that? Right? I mean, that is like the fundamental problem with something like real-time marketing is, whoa, you're telling me I have to respond to all my customers one by one. You know, I can't possibly do that because I'm a big brand and I get millions of tweets a day and how do you do that, right? And Or even how do I pay attention to all the conversations? How do I listen to all of them and make sense of all that data? So the kinds of tools that are going to allow us to take unstructured data from customer conversations and see patterns that will help us prioritize or see themes and conversations emerging and maybe even predict where those conversations are going to go so that we can be prepared to be in that conversation when it happens you know five hours from now or two days from now because we have tools that give us insight into trends as opposed to just what's happening right now it, it sounds like it's still the, the, the thing that won't change in, in this scenario, no matter what, is going to be the need for listening and, and for paying attention before you, you react. And, and that's what all these, these different you know, wearables and, and location-based data, the, the refinement of that from being broad to being you know, even indoor, for instance, um, is going to add some refinement to how we understand and listen to, to our customers. Tonya, um, we're going to move to our next segment, but what I do want to do is make sure because I think this is really interesting. Your um, your the blog that you guys are publishing is is incredible. Can you Thank sort you. of share where people can find you? Sure, it's the real time report is at therealtimereport.com. Um, we are on Twitter at real time report, and our hashtag is RLTM, which is the word real time without any vowels in it. So uh, follow the hashtag. People share a lot of great content. If you uh, use that hashtag, we'll, odds are we'll retweet you. And uh, look forward to uh, seeing what you guys find. That's awesome. I mean, we, we appreciate you coming on the on the show, and we want you to participate here. Uh, share a few of the things that have been hot topics for the week or things that I think we we happen to care about a little bit this week. But, Steve, you've got something to share that is on topic, uh, which we don't always have the privy of doing, um, or, or be, we don't always have the benefit of doing, uh, but what's, what do you got on, on your plate? Well, you know, um, Gartner uh, has a gentleman by the name of Richard Fouts, and uh, with, with uh, no disrespect for our... Relative of Janet? No relationship. Know. Anyway, he, he actually, uh, in March, he did a um, post about kind of he actually equated real-time marketing to, uh, uh, you know, uh, Carl Sandburg talked about this cat crawling along in the perspective who peers through the fog and trying to, you know, to see where real-time marketing is. And he's actually suggesting the fog is clearing. And and what he cites, most examples he cites in the article, and we, again, we'll share this on the, on the blog, is, is there are people, you know, you know, we've talked really about kind of, uh, and you, you alluded to it, Tanya, about, you know, the scalability of real-time marketing. I, I suspect that that the real advances in real-time marketing won't be human beings per se. Uh, one of the things, marketing automation, which has a horrible name, but marketing automation fundamentally, if done right, is is about just-in-time marketing. Mm -hmm. It's about marketing that's, that's appropriate. And so at, at that place, and I think this really ties in, Adam, to like, uh, your solo mo background, the social local mobile yeah, you know, these are all kind of consumer examples, but uh, there are things like from there's a company out of Seattle called Needle, who's like tracking shop, you know, shoppers' experiences in real time, his ability to like it's an opt-in thing, where they're trying to allow people to 
talk to peers in real time. There are a couple other examples in this about peers who want to like one of the one gentleman started a company because he wanted to buy a wetsuit, and he wanted to talk to a peer about this thing. So I think a lot of our real time uh, technologies will be people who are looking to buy something and want to talk to somebody in real time, um, and, and so it's, that, it's a high customization. Uh, was what we're really talking about. It won't be like you know right now. There's still this mentality in marketing about I just I cringe every time I hear email blast. I want to just Oh, I know. I hate that word. <laughs> I know it's so horrible. Actually, I, I school every time anybody says that, I sit them down and we have a conversation. I just I, I don't put it anymore. <laughs> Come here, son. Well, I do. I just said, you know, <laughs> hey, I don't mean any disrespect, but you know, an email blast <laughs> tells me that you just you're just you're pooping out something to everybody. <laughs> And I'll use those words. And I said, you know, and I'm sure you don't mean that. <laughs> but uh, are you pooping on your customers every are you time? Pooping you send well, this out? you know, that is an email blast. Is like where they get some content and they, they, they poop it out to everybody. And it's like, uh. so. But I think real time marketing is about like if I really do have a question and I want to talk to somebody else who bought a wetsuit. Real time marketing will be things that that connect me with that experience um, with my peers. You know, or you know, do some other kind of shopping. A couple companies are doing that. There's even stuff around uh, one gentleman is starting a service of tw uh, utilizing Twitter as an ability to keep update on, on appointments. There's like a 20% cancellation of doctor's appointments. So the idea is, is to be able to have a, a, a way to make appointments more, more easily and cancel appointments in, in real time. And another area, and I think this is going to be, I think this is going to be really common, is the ability to track what people are saying, talking about something. And, and then to, through through uh, interruption-based advertising to deliver an ad to some place where they are, an offer to that where they're at, that's relevant to that that thing. And so I think that, that ties back to the solo mo kinds of stuff. So anyway, we'll share that article. I think it's it's uh, I think this will have a lot of impact on marketing. I think I don't think other than my red herring question to Tanya earlier, I don't think it's a uh, a fad. I think this is a, another element that just talks about highly customized just-in-time marketing for the information that we want when we want it. You know, I'd ask you guys, it, based on something you said at the tail end of that, Steve, do you think that retargeting plays a part in this? Retargeting advertisements. You know, somebody does search or somebody goes to a site. That's I mean, the re evil side. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Well, I mean, why, why do you say that, though? Why, do, why is it evil? Retargeting? Because even after I buy the product, quite often I'm constantly bombarded buy the product and I've actually gone to the extent that if I see the product in a retargeting ad I will leave that website go to another browser and buy it there just to see what happens it makes me so angry um, that retargeting is the devil you know I, I saw I saw somebody noting that they were unhappy about retargeting for for instance social media world which was a, a you know a conference in San Diego about digital marketing and uh, and somebody stepped in, and, and I like this. Chris Penn uh, and the guys at Shift tend to do this a lot, where they'll see something, a conversation that a number of folks in the industry are all talking about on Twitter or on or on Facebook, and suddenly they'll respond to it and answer, how do you deal with this sort of thing right there the very next day on a blog post or even the same day. But at any rate, they were responding and saying what often happens is that folks don't put a limit on how many times the ad should show up yeah. for folks. And that's the reason. So people are not – I feel the same way, Janet, but at the same time, it's a sort of look at it and I say – there has to be a middle ground between being saturated by and bombarded by these ads all the freaking time now also because Twitter and Facebook have both started to support retargeting oh, and now you start to have it all in your social networks as well versus you know just seeing it a couple more times over the next 24 hours right. or something like that. So what we're really talking about here is I mean you, I mean Tony you didn't talk about why you didn't like native uh, uh, retargeting is it for the same reasons or something else? Very similar to what Janet said. It's not really very smart uh, to show me an ad after I've already bought the product. So, so what we're talking about is not that that's a bad idea. It's just poorly executed and, ha and, and has issues that need to be resolved. It's not that it's a bad medium. I would say that those are problems that need to be addressed as opposed to somehow it's intrinsically uh, a bad uh, strategy. Well, yeah. I think... I think I've blocked more ads that are clearly retargeting ads than any other ads. You know, right. I'm very fond of clicking. But because of the issues, right? You, I've been hearing issues. two issues here. One is they're annoying it, me. One is is what? that that it's continuing to show after you purchased, and the second is is that it's showing it basically too much 
if you haven't purchased it, and if those two solutions were were curved, or those two scenarios were curved a bit, it would it would feel more appropriate. It would be okay. I, I think to go back to what you said earlier, and in, in prob, I haven't read Chris Pan's post, but I'll go back and read it. I think that sure, it's done badly nine times out of ten, as are most ads. You would know, be, ads across platforms are. Most marketing you know, is done. Bad. Yeah, done badly. But otherwise, and we wouldn't makes, have jobs. True. <laughs> but that makes everybody look bad. And, you know, when somebody, like, and I'm going to call them out, SpyFu, for example, <laughs> I visited their site, and then I was followed by the little black spy guy, you know, and I was like, spy versus spy. I was going to try to figure out if I, I had more I, I time, exactly I would have worked that, out a better way to work around it. I know exactly that, that frustration. My, uh, my last girlfriend... Uh, managed a, a, a Lane Bryant store, which is a, a big girl store, and and she would get on my computer and like for weeks there'd be all these pictures of scantily dressed curvy women on my browser, and it was just horrible. I just it's just horrible. <laughs> uh, Did she do that just before she left, Steve? <laughs> <laughs> See, now we've given everybody a way to you know their own revenge scenario. <laughs> so I mean that you know that's that's a, I think that. My my uh, what do you say my my terrible retargeting story is a little different. It's when I get on Netflix and find all of the uh, the Victorian romantic movies are the ones that are being suggested suddenly instead of uh, you know the action and sci-fi stuff because my wife had spent a couple weeks watching those other ones. So, I really uh, liked it when they added that feature where you could split off the accounts because my yeah, son yeah. watches endless Bakugan movies and I really don't want to see it <laughs> on my stream. I don't even know what that is. I, I, you know, I just did that right now. So, uh, you know, that's that's me clearing out the retargeting queue there with the suggestion yeah. and stuff. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, so Janet, I'm, I'm holding back on, on my share in regards to... I, I don't have a share, but you and I talked before the show... And we sort of, you know, there's something that's been on our radar over the last couple of days that you wanted to share this week. Well, I think that, you know, one of the things that really we've loved watching Google Hangouts blossom. Uh, we've watched all Google Plus itself blossom, and there are a lot of us who use it really heavily. And there are a lot of people who don't use Google Plus at all. And, you know, yeah, okay, there's a lot of UI problems, and it's not the most... Uh, user-friendly thing in the world, but v when Vic Gondota quit, and he's the yeah, one and who really has, yeah, sorry. Go yeah, ahead. he's the really he's the one who really created Google Plus and has nurtured it, and you know has been at Google for eight years. He's left, and now all of a sudden we're getting all these reports of Google Plus employees getting shunted off to Android, for example. Um, so there have been these stories, and I'll post a link. In the um, on the website, but there was a really excellent post about it. About is Google Plus going to become a ghost town? And the response to that, and, and I'll let you take that, Adam. I mean, people have been saying that Google Plus is a ghost town for for the last year. So you know, it becoming a ghost town, it's it's sort of this it's a little bit of a flip flop here. Um, I mean, in general, I just think that it's funny that people think that because somebody has resigned, the bottom line is, is if they wanted to take somebody off of a product at a company, he doesn't have to resign to, to, to be taken off the product. He can just simply be taken off the product. Marissa Mayer, for instance, was somebody on search, uh, or on, she eventually got over to you, I think, location-based stuff, and then she ended up moving on to other things. So bottom line is, is people, I think, are reading a little bit too far into one employee moving on to... Um, something you know else as as suddenly this entire platform that's been invested into going away um, I'm not saying that there's no chance that it will but I think that Google Plus is definitely a place where there seems to be a lot more effort has been invested over the last few years than than uh, in anything that that's uh, that Google has put out and has had any level of success if you look at something like Google Waves uh, or I'm trying to even remember a couple of the other sort of social products that they have they've had so I don't think we're anywhere near sort of thinking that it's a ghost town or will be a ghost town. Um, if you look at the numbers and you look at the activity, it is not exactly a Facebook. It is not exactly a Twitter. It is its, it is itself. And it's the same thing as saying Twitter is not exactly a Facebook and it's not exactly a Google Plus as well. It is itself. And so when people continue to compare it to Facebook and make it sound like there needs to be, it needs to be a, an Apple to Apple to compete with the world of social media, I think they're thinking about it uh, very wrong. 
Anybody else? I could go on for a really long time, but I won't. I, I actually, the only thing, I, I know this is a little short and proud of me, but uh, I wanted to talk just, just from passing about the uh, hashtag MyNYPD, um, which was uh, NY, the New York Police Department wanted to do an outreach using social and, and on kind of an appreciation day. And, and the thing was, take a photo with a cop and, and tweet it. And so, needless to say, some of the, some of the police uh, there got a little enthusiastic with some of the folks out and about, and there was a skirmish, and so there, it just it imploded with a lot of pictures of police uh, aggressiveness. And, and I think this, and, and other than like, you know, kind of enjoying that, uh, I think it's a really good example is if when you're, people talk about authenticity, and I, it's just horrible because no one knows what it means. But when your brand, when you're actually, you know, boots on the street, so to speak, of your Literally. brand, uh, <laughs> of your brand, are, are, are there's, you know, the New York Police Department has had tons of issues, still has issues. And, and it's not in their, their brand, their authenticity is overly aggressive often with people. I know people in the city who, you know, buskers and folks who have dealt with issues with the cops before. A lot of great cops, but there are a lot of bad ones, which will issue. This is that where that disconnect between authenticity is. Because you have cops out there who are being too aggressive with the, with, with the citizenry. And, and they use the social platform, and it backfires in a horrible, horrible way. Take a selfie when you're catching a beatdown. Well, that was kind of what, what it was. But we've seen yep. that happen before, right? Anytime you use a hashtag campaign and you're presuming that your customers are all going to love you and that your fans are only going to say positive things, you're yep. setting yourself up. It happened to McDonald's uh, a couple of years ago. I don't remember what the hashtag was, but I don't know if you guys remember that example. But it was There's one recently, too, I think. It was a similar concept, yeah. and people were tweeting horrible things to that hashtag. And so mm -hmm. a hashtag is not something that you control. Um, and people forget that. And you know, and anyone who had said to me, "We're going to do a my NYPD hashtag campaign," I mean, does that not write out the game? What were they thinking? Yeah, <laughs> that's what it comes down to for me: is what were they thinking? <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely definitely a misalignment of brand uh, promise and brand delivery. Yeah, the, the, the answer for all the folks that I remember in the past having asked, how do I claim a or get a hashtag? You don't get one. You hopefully <laughs> you use it, you use it and you hope that nobody else decides to use it for the wrong purposes as well. I mean we've even had that early on with the show here with Friday Hangout where We still do. You it's know, taken we're, over by cr cricket in India. Yeah, so people need to stop hanging out in India on Fridays, hanging out with cricket or Damn whatever it. that that sport is. Um well, on that note, I wanted to uh, say thank you again, Tonya, very much. In fact, I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, again, it happens every so often where we get somebody here, I think, that really sh sheds some light on, on an area that's far different than I think what maybe our initial perspe uh, perspective is on a few things. So I think you've done that, at least for me, so I appreciate that. Um, and, uh, and and so, Steve, uh, before I sort of go into our wrap, where can folks find you, mister? They can find me on uh, Twitter at Steveology or the Steve Farnsworth uh, blog, my blog, uh, which is Steveology blog. And then Janet? You can find me at JanetFouts.com or JFouts pretty much everywhere. And uh, before I, I sort of tell folks where they can find me, I want to make sure that you guys know uh, that every single week we're here in real time, live, recording around 11-ish, which means if we all get our butts in the seats and are ready to go by 11 o'clock, um, Friday, 11 o'clock Pacific. Um, we also can be found, all the shows and those sorts of things, and what we're going to be talking about the week you know, after uh, and all of our previous shows are at the FridayHangout.com. You can view recordings on YouTube. Uh, so if you want to see the video, if you want to see our faces, um, all that sort of thing, that's on YouTube. But if you want to listen to just the audio, you, you can, of course, subscribe on iTunes, Spreaker.com, and even listen on iHeartRadio. So, you know, while you're driving to work or whatever, you can pull up some of the episodes there. And, Fascinating. Uh, and you, or if you have a hard time going to sleep. If you, exactly. <laughs> I would actually loop it just in just Steve's voice, what I've done frequently, actually. Um, 
Uh, and then, uh, you know, makes me want to just put a pillow on my face. Um, but uh, in, in the end, we want to also please ask if you guys could go ahead and go to iTunes uh, and, and Spreaker and leave us reviews. It would be really awesome and great. It helps other people discover the show. Uh, and, and, you know, we do this for free out of the kindness of our heart because we love to talk about this stuff and talk with folks like Tonya and others about this topic. And um, on that note, you can find me at uh, Secret Sushi on Twitter. SecretSushi.com is my website. And until next Friday at 11-ish Pacific uh, or, uh, you know, otherwise, if you listen to us not in real time, thank you guys for listening, and we'll talk to you next week. We love your faces. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank 